Hello and welcome to another episode of InvestorIdeas.com podcast. Um, been away for the last two months, but uh, obviously there's a lot to catch up on in the industry now. Uh, so in today's podcast, I'll be going through a few different industry announcements as well as how they relate to overall industry trends that have been noticed over the last few months and sort of where the industry is heading moving forward. Uh, so first today's announcement is from Canopy Growth Corporation trading on the TSX as weed and the NASDAQ as CGC. So they announced last Thursday that it's entered into an agreement to sell its Hershey's Drive facility in Smith Falls, Ontario, as part of the company's transformation to a more simplified asset light operational model. Um, Canopy Growth will retain its Smith Falls based uh, post-harvest manufacturing facility, but they will be selling again their main uh, facility that they bought from Hershey's Canada back a while ago. So if you paid attention to this announcement in the past, um, this was a big thing for the Smith Falls community as the Hershey facility had been very integral to the sort of community's industry and when Canopy Growth had bought that, that was promising a lot of jobs. Obviously over the last year we've seen a lot of the bigger LPs including Canopy Growth have to have lots of layoffs. Um, They laid off over 800 people this year alone I believe Um, and so kind of a backward step but what's weird about it is they are going to be selling it back to Hershey Canada uh, for a cash consideration of approximately 53 million Canadian. Now quoting here from uh, David Klein, the chief executive officer, we're pleased to have reached an agreement with Hershey on this important sale. This is the latest milestone in our focused effort to reduce costs and further enhance our balance sheet. Each of these steps we've taken as part of our transformation to a simplified asset light model which supports our ability to deliver in-demand products from brands our customers love with greater agility and less execution risks. Now, once again, we have demonstrated Canopy Growth's ability to achieve significant organizational and operational change to position the company for future growth in the Canadian market. Our intent to purchase the Hershey's Drive property in Smith Falls is another example of the strategic investments we're making in our supply chain network and our Canadian operations to support growth. And this was from Jason Riemann, the Chief Supply Chain Officer from Hershey Canada. Uh, So upon the completion of the transaction, Canopy Growth will have sold a total of seven properties for an aggregate gross amount of approximately 155 million Canadian since April of this year. And the net proceeds received from the sale of the facility will be used primarily to pay down the company's senior secured uh, credit facility. Now this sale follows the centralization of the post-harvest manufacturing at the company's forward beverage facility in Smith Falls, as well as the consolidation of all flower cultivation in the company's purpose-built facilities in Kincardine, Ontario, and Kelowna, B.C. Uh, So again, basically, like many of the companies, we've been paying attention to the Canadian market, a lot of consolidation. Basically, a lot of these companies realized that these massive production facilities that they built early on in anticipation of how big the market was going to grow, how fast everything was going to move along, didn't materialize. And so now a lot of these companies, uh, especially the larger LPs, and I would say mostly exclusively the larger LPs in Canada, um, are really looking at trying to sell off some of their giant assets that they made and trying to make um, basically a more streamlined system. Now, if you've been paying attention to sort of the difference between what's going on in Canada and the U.S., in the U.S., you've been looking at uh, multi-state operators, and their difference there is that they've been acquiring brands and sort of building a house of brands. Um, Some companies have done this in Canada as well. Um, For instance, Canopy Rivers has kind of done this, the offshoot of Canopy Growth. Um, They've changed since then, but that was kind of their early model. And there's been a few other companies even looking at, um, I can't really think of the name right now, but there has been other examples of this in Canada. You haven't seen as much of that, uh, but mainly in the U.S. you've seen that the reality is a little more apparent to them. And also this is kind of the benefit of the restricted model that exists in the U.S. So because companies have to go state by state, there really isn't an advantage to building this sort of giant mega company. Whereas there is an advantage to basically acquiring and partnering with a bunch of small companies and that actually has seemed to benefit a lot of these companies when you're looking at the difference of profits and financing between the U.S. and Canada, there's a lot more benefits to the U.S. market. The downside is they don't have the same access to legal capital, uh, legal banking, and then there's a lot of the sort of back-end issues of it. So obviously the federal... Legalization in the U.S. is what's holding back these U.S. companies, but at the same time, the fact that it isn't federally legalized has actually allowed these companies to grow in a much more 
I would say, constructive and efficient way than what we've seen in Canada. Basically, because Canada just allowed sort of the gloves to come off right away, um, you saw a lot of people just making big bets that, unfortunately, in the long term, we've seen haven't really paid off. So when we're looking at you know canopy growth here, they're not really alone in this. Again, there's a lot of Canadian companies who are doing the same thing. You're seeing this is a period of consolidation. If you listen to some of our earlier podcasts when legalization was first beginning, um, you know, we'll go back through all the old episodes. But in some of those early ones, this is what people talked about early on, very cut and dry, was they said, yeah, there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of boom in the market, there's a lot of things going on, but the reality is, at a certain point, a lot of this stuff is going to have to backpedal itself. Um, you know, speaking here from the uh, mayor of Smith Falls, who was Sean Pankow, it's almost like we're in a time work effect. Are we going back in time? Is this really 2023, or are we back here in the 1960s when the Hershey story first started in Smith Falls? Um, so he kind of commented about this weird set of reality where the Hershey's facility had closed down in Smith Falls. That was a big impact to Smith Falls over the last few decades. Canopy Growth came in, bought that facility. It seemed like it was going to be a big boom for that area. Then it obviously uh, had to have some backpedaling. And now, weirdly enough, Hershey is going back into that same area um, to actually bring jobs back to the community. So overall, it's still a good thing for Smith Falls. Um, but definitely is showing what's going on in Canada and the overall trend that's being noticed here. Now on kind of the opposite side of things, I'm noticing maybe a different style or a different approach to what's going on in the industry when you're looking at Tilray Brands Incorporated, which trades on the NASDAQ and the TSX as TLRY. Um, they announced last week the acquisition of, or the remaining acquisition of Trust Beverage Co., which was from Molson Coolers, uh, trading on the New York Stock Exchange's TAP. Now, uh, this is a weird one, so if you're paying attention to Tilray right now, um, a few weeks earlier they had announced that they were acquiring alcoholic brands from Anheuser-Busch, um, so they acquired a few of their different brands, Shock Top, uh, Breckenridge Brewery, Blue Point Brewing, uh, Ten Barrel Brewing Company, Red Hook Brewery, Wilderness Brewing, Brothers Brewing, Square Mile Cider Company, and Highball Energy. Um, so that was their previous acquisition focusing specifically on alcoholic beverage brands but this is kind of adding to their overall beverage segment. So if you're looking at Tilray right now, um, by acquiring the remaining of Trust Beverages and then also acquiring these brands from Anheuser-Busch, they've set themselves up to at least be big players within the beverage industry, um, whether you're looking at THC-infused beverages, alcoholic beverages, or the functional beverage market. They kind of have a distribution network that can serve all three, and obviously within that, they have a bunch of different styles of beverages. So they have more beer styles, they have obviously sort of the, the more you know soda juice and health beverages that are coming with the THC beverage market they have the functional beverage market and then sort of everything in between there so in a big way they're just betting huge on beverages now it's interesting to see that obviously from the other side of the beverage market um, for Molson and for Anheuser-Busch they were pretty happy to sell these things and from their perspective they're realizing that the potential for the THC beverages so selling of trust beverages for Molson seemed like an obvious thing um, mainly because they don't see the THC beverages taking off the way they had initially expected. Um, so for Tilray, this is a great way to, again, continue to set themselves up for if legalization changes happen, which they are expecting. You know, there's a lot of talk still about some sort of federal legalization or decriminalization or safe banking or something going on in the U.S. We've heard this story for the last four to five years. So far, nothing has materialized. Um, and so far, it's a lot of the same sort of bait and switch where you see over and over again um, you know people bring this different bills forward uh, those bills get sort of discussed you maybe get them passed through one layer of legislation and then they don't go through the senate obviously and i think that that's something you're going to see over and over again for the next while until there's some sort of massive governmental change in the u.s uh, which obviously is a big thing that's going on in the U.S. right now. There's a lot of different independent candidates who are coming forward. There's a lot of different candidates within the Democratic and Republican Party who are saying, let's say, some more radical things than the more established narratives that we've seen so far. Um, there are people who are definitely talking about bringing these initiatives forward and making them a reality, but in the past, the, if you're paying, paying attention to the cannabis industry, there's been lots of things promised that actually don't materialize into anything. So this would be something that, you know, 
pay attention to it, but don't maybe bet all in. It does seem like Tilray is betting in in a pretty huge way right now. Um, so, like I said, they're pretty heavily invested in the beverage sector overall, whether you're looking at alcoholic beverages or THC imbued beverages or just beverages in general. Um, there is also expectations that within Canada, you're going to see some regulatory changes eventually, um, allowing for different sales options for THC beverages, for different dosage options. Um, when it comes to basically everything within the edibles, beverage, and oils market, there's still a lot of discussions about regulatory changes to make it more realistic to what actually is what consumers are looking for. Um, and the reality is, is as long as things are clearly labeled, I've talked about this a lot in the podcast in the past, there is no reason um, as far as when you're looking at health and safety. Um, it's, it's a huge misdirect from a lot of people who just don't know anything about this industry, but you can just look at the alcohol industry. Like You can sell a huge range of alcoholic beverages all in one store. They have the alcohol percentage labeled on them. That's how people know what they're buying. And you know the difference is is there's actually a huge amount of danger of people actually dying from alcohol consumption that's a real thing you can absolutely consume too much alcohol and die um, right away nothing has ever been proven with cannabis there are no overdoses with cannabis there's a lot of people talk about overdoses with cannabis about people being hospitalized but a lot of that is essentially people freaking out when they're high going to the hospital and the hospital just has to calm them down there's nothing that actually they can do to you other than basically hydrate you and keep you calm um, there are no things you know when you're looking at alcohol poisoning they're pumping your stomach they're you know adding fluids to you there's a lot of these things there really isn't anything because of how cannabis is absorbed into your body how it's processed and really how its effects work so it's a very different scenario but essentially people should be allowed if they want to to buy higher dose options just like they should also be allowed to buy lower dose options and those can all exist in the same store and saying that people are too stupid basically to understand the difference between 10 and 100 seems quite you know depressing to think about that that's the justification is that oh well if you sell you know 200 milligrams what if people buy them and then they get too high well it says 200 so if you bought something you know it's like going buying a giant bottle of whiskey and drinking it all in one day people might be stupid um but at least the risks associated with cannabis are thousandfold less than when you're dealing with alcohol um, even just most basic medications that you buy in a drugstore like people can die from Tylenol and aspirin much more likely they can die from cannabis and we sell those no problem um, so I think that that's a big misdirect that's always being put from people who don't understand this industry and people who are just skeptical about cannabis overall there's still lots of propaganda against cannabis there always will be um, really for a long time and I think it, it's probably forever I don't think you'll convince a certain percentage of the population ever that cannabis is safe or that it's a natural you know plant medicine that actually has lots of benefits to the human body when it comes to inflammation when it comes to you know your overall mental health um, but such is what it is um, so again when you're looking at Tilray they're they're focused on the beverage side of the industry there could be changes within Canada um, within the next year or two that actually does seem likely mainly because at this point, the main reason to justify this is competition with the illegal market. So when you're looking at why people are still buying illicit cannabis products in Canada and you can buy them everywhere, online is just impossibly easy. Even though they shut down these websites, they pop up a new one tomorrow. A big difference there with the competition. Uh, priced, you're not going to be able to compete because of taxation. Obviously, that's a big discussion. People would love to have taxation go down, but it's probably not going to happen overnight or really anytime soon. But what you can do is at least compete with dosage and quality. Um, that's the biggest thing that we've seen overall when it comes to beverages and when it comes to extracts. So when you're looking at, you know, like the THC diamonds and things like that, that can't really be produced very well in the illicit market. You have to have access to really good equipment. You know, people who are running a, an illicit store don't have access to super critical CO2 extractors. It's, if they do, then damn, they're subtle about it. But most of the time, they're going to have less equipment they're going to have less scientific expertise they're going to have less funding so that is where the industry can compete and we've seen this with lots of extract brands in canada which are sort of small niche uh, businesses that pop up focus on you know basically selling like the high-end sort of caviar of the cannabis industry and they've done really well because again if people will pay that price even if it's 50 or 60 dollars a gram 
if it is actually that much better. It's like buying scotch or buying fine wine. People will do it. Not everyone's going to do it, but you can build at least a niche market, and it's a way to realistically compete with the illegal market. Um, and so dosage, hopefully, will go through uh, changes to that. Uh, there's already been minor changes as far as how many like cans of beverages people could buy at a time. That's a small step forward. So I do think that overall the beverage market does have potential. There's a lot of talks about eventually... Um, utilizing some sort of like THC beverages on taps in restaurants or bars it seems less likely because it seems like most cities don't want to have cannabis consumption lounges at least so far um, there's been a few places in Ontario that are kind of semi-piloting it and thinking about it there's a lot of discussions in Vancouver but so far you get a lot of opposition to cannabis consumption pledges because people just basically say that there's going to be some sort of drug den or something crazy crazy right away even though we've seen in the states with the cons cannabis consumption lounges they've done really well it's helped the businesses out it's helped the industry out and that is the long term what needs to happen is you need spaces where people can actually consume these products as opposed to always having to buy them and go home it's a big competitive advantage that the alcohol industry has over the cannabis industry is you can go to a restaurant you can go to a bar you can go to a bunch of different places where alcohol is the primary social lubricant cannabis doesn't have that option even most concerts and most you know arena venues and things you go to you kind of got to sneak in your edibles i mean yes you can smoke joints at some concerts in some places but some people will still be pissy about it some people will you know bare minimum just seize your product and and there's just the feeling of you know people don't really most people don't really want to be doing sketchy shit most of the time people just want to be doing something that's normal they want to be able to go to a place buy you know Give me that cannabis beverage. They buy from the store, they sit, they drink it during the concert. That's a normal experience. That's why people will choose cheap beer. Not everyone loves the cheap beer that's sold at a concert, but that's what's there, so they're not going to sneak in their beer. Like, You're always going to get people doing some illegal stuff, but the vast majority of people, we've seen this with uh, streaming services, right? It was a great example of when you had pirating videos, we think that's the end of the movie industry. That's the end of TV. It's all over. Then people create streaming services. People will pay the 10 bucks a month or the 20 bucks a month or whatever the hell it's going to be in the future. But the reality is, is most people will choose the legal option if it makes sense and is available to them. And that's definitely what Tilray Brands is betting on. They're, they're thinking this is going to happen at some point, whether in Canada or the U.S., that they're going to be able to jump into this market more aggressively. In the meantime, their acquisition of the Anheuser-Busch um, brands and breweries is a little bit of profit coming in. They are well-received brands. Um, they did good market research on this. They also have some of their functional beverages, so they're at least setting themselves up with enough potential revenue streams to make sure that they can ride the storm out until they get sort of that big move. And speaking of other big potential moves, um, in the EU, Germany's cabinet has announced the approval of a controversial groundbreaking bill last week um, that might allow adults to buy and possess small amounts of cannabis for recreational use. Uh, so you get 25 grams and you can grow a maximum of three plants. Obviously, there's a lot of opposition to this already. Um, the EU marketplace gets talked about a lot from the cannabis industry. There was so much hype early on when you saw legalization in Canada to begin with. And then unfortunately, none of that really materialized into anything. You've seen slow growth of medical markets within the EU um, in different places. In the UK, they've got you know some systems. In Germany, they've got a fairly decent medical system. Um, but nothing's really materialized into an aggressive growth for any of these companies. Um, so looking at what's going on in Germany, though, there is one company, and uh, not one, but there's many companies, at least one so far, who has come forward and is looking at, obviously, getting into that area, um, Cureleaf, who just recently announced today that they've commenced adult use sales in their Manchester, Connecticut location. They're also looking at what's going on in Germany. Uh, so Cureleaf expects to start selling in recreational use in Germany by the end of next year, ideally, obviously, if this bill goes through. And they're targeting a potential windfall after sort of the hype and expectations around um, Olaf Scholz's government announcement. Many people will be coming to cannabis for the first time and trying it out, says Miles Wolm, who is the president of Cureleaf International, a London-based subsidiary of the U.S. company. And he pointed out how recreational sales of cannabis have surpassed those of medical use in America. And that has 
basically been his justification. Uh, we will do everything we can to build up the business, said Bohm, adding that he expects to start selling to customers in Germany by the end of 2024. Um, so again, when you're looking at other markets, whether you're looking at Canada or the U.S., you've seen medical come in, it sort of builds out the industry to some extent. It at least changes some of the public perception, and then recreational comes in. And I would say that for a lot of companies and for a lot of the industry as a whole, though, there has been some disadvantages to this business model or sort of legalization model that's come in the past. Um, unfortunately, what you see a lot of the time is the medical model starts to fall apart as the recreational model builds up. And then you also start to see quality drop to some extent, oversaturation, and some of the other issues that go with this industry development. So I would say, yeah, it's a good thing that they're going to be possibly moving to recreational. I wouldn't bet on it right this second because, again, there's been a lot of promises made for cannabis legalization and regulatory changes all throughout the world over the last five years. Not all of them have materialized, and even the ones that have materialized have had a lot of issues with them. When you're looking at each state's legalization in the U.S., and when you're looking at overall legalization in Canada, there has been a lot of downsides. There's been a lot of issues with these companies being able to actually do what they want to do um, and not just be held back by difficult taxation, by regulatory hurdles, by a lot of different factors. And the general reason here that Germany is pushing this is they're trying to say again that this is the way to compete with the illicit market, that this is a way to stop illegal trade. And then there's the opposition that says that what happens is this becomes more normalized and they can cite examples like California. And unfortunately, California does make a good case for the fact that once you allow for legalization, and even in New York right now, um, once you allow for this sort of decriminalization and the normalization of cannabis, you do get a lot of people who are bad actors and start operating illicit businesses because they don't want to pay the taxes. And it's hard not to even blame them for that because a lot of the taxation is what's killing the legal industry. When you're looking at California, a lot of the legal businesses are finding it difficult to compete with the illegal businesses because of the taxation policies, because of the regulatory burdens, because of the financial needs that are required to even get your license to begin with. And then they have people who have been, you know, longtime growers or even people who were part of the legacy medical market who then say, well, we're just going to keep selling our cannabis because we know it's a good product. But then there's all the issues, right, is then people can't tell which is an illegal store, which is a legal store. They're all next to each other. Um, and, you know, the police don't have the time or the energy or the resources to go around cracking down on these businesses. They do some in California. They've done some in New York. But at the end of the day, it just becomes too difficult and too random. Um, so this is a potential problem that it is justifiable for the German opposition party to argue against is that once you allow for this, if you don't allow for a stable enough legal market to come in and to compete aggressively with the illegal market, you will probably get a bunch of pop-ups of illegal businesses that will compete alongside the legal industry and then it's really hard to tell which is which. And so we'll see how things go in Germany. I'd say there's not even a huge likelihood that this bill does get fully passed, but if it does, these will be the things to pay attention to. Like I said, companies like Cureleaf are positioning themselves right away and making sure that they're going to be in there if this market opens up. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a few other companies that are either Canadian or US based that are eyeing this as well. I'm sure you're going to hear a bunch of announcements or at least discussions over it over the next couple of weeks. Um, people positioning themselves, again, similarly to how uh, Trulief has, or sorry, Tilray has positioned themselves with uh, the beverage market. But overall, I'd say it's still too early to tell. Uh, and again, September 4th, we'll know more accurately what's going to go on in Germany, and then you can see from there. So lastly, looking at different approaches in the industry, we'll look at Organogram Holding Incorporated, uh, who announced the relaunch of one of their best-known brands, Trailblazers. So this is something you're also starting to see as an overall trend is sort of a relaunch or rebranding of original brands. As these companies start consolidating, as they start looking at what's going on with the industry as a whole, they look at where their successes have been. Uh, so for Organogram Holdings, Trailblazers has been one of their success stories where they've had at least fairly consistent sales. They've done the best with that brand over some of their other brands. So relaunching it, rebringing it to the market. Um, and it will be featuring, obviously, some more updated products now. So they're going to have THCV gummies. Um, they're also going to have different pre-rolls, some infused pre-rolls. But it's all going to be under this Trailblazer brand. Uh, you know, the good thing about this is it is somewhat of a brand that's already recognized. The bad part about this is 
depending on what customer experiences were with the past with Trailblazer, they could have people that just ignore this because they could have got product that just wasn't properly stored or something. And this has been a big issue with the cannabis industry all overall, as it's really hard to create consistency other than in the edibles and extracts market. And even within that market, it's really hard to guarantee that your product is properly sold. Um, from the retail standpoint, you could have uneducated bud tenders, you could have bud tenders who are you know, promoting different products or saying the wrong thing. And then there's the consumer education part of it as well. So building brand awareness within the industry is still a big struggle for everyone. No one's really gotten um, heavy traction with anything. There's been some celebrity brands that have, you know, sort of held on for a while. But I think in general, the, the problem is, is it's really difficult to maintain consistency. It's really difficult to scale out any of these brands without sort of starting to dilute what your end result is. Um, and then there's the end of the day is there's so much limitations on branding, on packaging, on marketing, and everything else that goes into brand awareness that would normally exist for every other company. So for a lot of these businesses, they, even though some people might recognize it, next year they might have to change the package because of some regulatory change or because they can't get the same packaging from that distributor. Or XYZ, there's a lot of different things that impact each individual business. And the problem is, is as packaging keeps changing, as stores rechange their shelves, as product becomes unavailable because of product loss or inconsistencies, um, you know, a crop yield could just have too high or too low of a THC percentage and then they can't sell it. And this has happened a lot. And I think that this is a big problem. Obviously, you do need some sort of THC percentage guidelines. So people, again, aren't buying product that's going to freak them out but on the other hand having this sort of strict demand of what THC is in the plant is very difficult to maintain over a long time um, and obviously there's a lot of people within the industry who have sort of an ongoing debate about what should be more focused on which terpenes or cannabinoids overall should be looked at to try to identify um, even when it comes to strains there's obviously a lot of confusion and a lot of sort of snake oil discussions out there when it comes to which strains actually deliver which results and even amongst those strains can you get differences and inconsistencies and the answer is yes so for the industry as a whole it's going to be difficult for any of these companies to really brand themselves effectively um, but they're doing the best they can and i do think that you're going to see other companies like organogram here try to maybe reposition some of their older brands and also try to update them to make them more competitive with the current landscape as you're starting to add in infused pre-rolls, as you're starting to add in different options out there. They're going to have to stay competitive, but it is smart to go back to brands that at least people somewhat recognize. And you've seen this in the past with different companies where they're focusing on one part of their company that's actually had some success and trying to just keep that going. And again, it's a time of consolidation. It's a time of trying to make your company as lean as possible to get through the next couple of years while there's still a lot of limbo around federal legalization or decriminalization in the U.S., while there's still a lot of limbo around taxation and regulatory changes in Canada, and there's still a lot of confusion around what's going to go on in the EU and other marketplaces in the world. So kind of that's the overall trends that have been noticed, I, you know, sorry I've been away for the last couple of months, but uh, the industry hasn't done much also in the last couple of months other than, you know, the usual game, which has been unfortunately a lot of stock drops and a lot of selling off of assets. Um, and then again, a lot of discussions around things that may potentially happen, but haven't potentially, you know, aren't actually going to happen in the long term. We can talk about safe banking every day of the week. It doesn't mean it's going to be a reality. And uh, the same with some of these things going on again in Germany and Canada and the US. There's a lot of hopeful potentials for the future. Um, and I do think, you know, if you're looking at long term investments, a lot of these companies have couldn't be cheaper right now uh, as far as investing in them. But there is the risk of when does this actually materialize into a long-term strength industry and will that actually be the future again there's you know a lot of competition from other industries from alcohol industries from pharmaceutical industries there's a lot of segmentation even of the cannabis industry so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out um, but definitely for right now uh, it looks like at least some of these companies are starting to have good strategies for long-term success and at least starting to realize where they're at um, but in general not a great time for the industry that's all for today's podcast enjoy the rest of your day that's all for today's podcast podcast is now a certified word trademark on the blockchain through cognate incorporated cm certification InvestorIdeas.com podcasts are also available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play Music, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, and TuneIn. 
If you'd like to be a guest or sponsor of this podcast, please contact InvestorIdeas.com. Investor Ideas reminds all listeners to read our disclaimers and disclosures on the InvestorIdeas.com website, and this podcast is not an endorsement to buy products or services or securities. Investors are reminded that all investments involve risk and possible loss of investment. Investor Ideas does not condone the use of cannabis except where permissible by law. Our site does not possess, distribute, or sell cannabis products.